All right, we're back. So let's look at induction one more time. And if you like the last video, you'll like this one. Or maybe I should be more precise. If I can show that you like the last video, and I can show that whenever you like a video, you'll like the next video, well, by the principle of induction, you'll like all future videos. So I got that going for me, which is nice. Anyway, today we'll do three things. First, a bit of review. Second, we will justify the principle of induction by using the well-ordering principle. And finally, we will do a ton of examples. Quick reminder for our review. We already had direct proof, proof by contrapositive, proof by contradiction. When these all fail, whom do we turn to? As you saw from that highly technical and completely mathematical demonstration, induction is a powerful tool, especially when we are being asked to prove that a proposition holds for all natural numbers. And as we can see, it's also part of a complete breakfast. Jeb. Induction. Induction. The cornerstone of any nutritious breakfast. state the principle of induction as the following theorem, which can be written very compact matter. If we know that P1 is true, and whenever P is true for a particular K, it is also true for K plus 1, this gives us that P of N is true for any N in the natural numbers. Another way of saying this, an induction proof has two steps. The first step is the base case, which is to establish that P of 1 is true. The next step is the induction step which means we assume that P of K is true, and then we show that this implies that P K plus one is true. Now, of course, this last step is an implication, and in different contexts, we might prove the induction step directly, or by contradiction, or by the contrapositive, whatever happens to be the most convenient. Okay, if we have that P of one is true, and for all K in the natural numbers, P of K implies P of K plus one, then the idea behind induction goes like this. Let's think of the natural numbers as sort of like a chain of beads going off to the right. One, two, three, and so forth. We know that one is true because we have P of one is true. We know that two is true because P of one implies P of two and P of one is true. We know that three is true because P of two implies P of three and two is true. We know that four is true because P of three implies P of four, and P of three is true. Following this sort of logic, we can get to any n in n steps. We say that a set of real numbers is well-ordered if every non-empty subset has a minimum element. 
We take as an axiom that the natural numbers is a well-ordered set. What that specifically means is that every set of natural numbers has a least element. Now you might ask, how can we take this as an axiom? How do we know that the natural numbers have this property? In fact, when one constructs the natural numbers from the basics of set theory, one can show that the natural numbers are well ordered, and in some sense, the natural orders are constructed to have this property. This is kind of a subtle point that we won't talk about too much in this class. So from the standpoint of where we are now, let us just take as an axiom that the natural numbers are well ordered, which again, specifically means that any set of natural numbers has a least element. Now we're going to prove the principle of induction, and we're going to use a proof by contradiction. Specifically, let us assume that P of 1 is true. Let us assume that P of K implies P of K plus 1 for all K in the natural numbers. And let's assume that the conclusion is false, such that for all N, P of N is a false statement. Remember the rules of negation means that the negation of for all n p of n is there exists an n such that p of n is false. So let's let s be the set of all natural numbers such that p is false. So the set of all q and n such that p of q is false. By assumption, s is non-empty. By the well-ordering principle, s must have a least element. Let's call it r. So what we have is that P of R is false because R is an S, but P of R minus one is true because R minus one is not an S because R is the least element of S. But we also have that P of R minus one implies P of R. These can all be true. There's a contradiction here. Since we've reached a contradiction, that means that our original assumption was wrong. Do you have it? Induction. Induction. The cornerstone of any nutritious breakfast. That's right. Good. Do you mind if I have well ordering principle to wash this down? Go right ahead. There's an interesting principle, or even a meta principle, that applies here, and this is more general than induction. So let A be any subset of the natural numbers, and assume that we can show for any n in A there exists an m in A where m is less than n. Said in words, whenever we can get an element of A, we can always find a smaller element also in A. If this is true, then A must be empty. How do we prove this? Well, assume A is not empty by way of a contradiction. Then it has a least element. Let's call it m. But by the assumption above, there exists a Q in A where Q is less than M. This contradicts the fact that M was the least element. Since we've arrived at a contradiction, our assumption was false. And this implies that A must be empty. Again, we'll see some cases later in the course where we apply this principle directly, not even using induction. Here's a useful thing to know. Let's say we have some formula. Sn is the sum i equals 0 to n g of i, where g is just some function. Right? We've seen examples of this. For example, in the triangular numbers, g of i is just i itself. Okay? Well, let's figure out what happens when we expand this out in two different ways. If we think of Sn plus 1, that's the sum 0 to n plus 1 of g of i, which is g of 0 plus g of 1 plus g of 2 up to g of n plus g of n plus 1. If we write down Sn, that gives us the sum i equals 0 to n, so it's g of 0, g of 1, g of 2, all the way up to g of n, missing the last term. In particular, this means that Sn plus 1 is Sn plus g of n plus 1. Okay, so basically, if we define some object as a running total of some function, then it's relatively easy to get a recursive formula because the difference between those two sums is we just peel off the last term. 
This sort of calculation comes up so often that it's worth writing it down right here. Now let's consider the alternating sequence. 1 minus 4 plus 9 minus 16 plus 25 minus 36 and so on. Basically what we're doing is we're alternately adding and subtracting the square numbers. Writing this in summation notation, we get that Sn equals the sum i equals 0 to n minus 1 to the i times i squared. Note, of course, that whether we start the sum at 0 or 1 doesn't actually matter because the first term would be 0 anyway. Our ultimate goal here is to compute a formula in closed form for Sn. Let's start by computing a few answers. So S1 is 1. S2 is 1 minus 4, which is minus 3. S3 is 1 minus 4 plus 9, which is 6. S4 is 1 minus 4 plus 9 minus 16, which is minus 10. S5 is 1 minus 4 plus 9 minus 16 plus 25, which is 15. And S6 is 1 minus 4 plus 9 minus 16 plus 25 minus 36, which is minus 21. Now, this pattern might look familiar. The numbers 1, 3, 6, 10, 15, 21, we've seen before. Those are actually the triangular numbers. So it looks to us as if this sum is sort of an alternating sum of the triangular numbers. More specifically, the nth value of the sum is minus 1 to the n plus 1 times tn, or explicitly, since we have a formula for tn, minus 1 to the n plus 1 times n times n plus 1 over 2. Let's try to prove this formula. First, we do the base case. When n equals 1, well, Sn is 1, just 1, that's the only term there. And when we plug in 1 into this formula, we get minus 1 squared, 1 times 2 over 2, which is 1. Great. Now we do the induction step. Let us assume that Sk is minus 1 to the k plus 1 times k times k plus 1 over 2. Using the principle we did a minute ago, Sk plus 1 equals Sk plus minus 1 to the k plus 1 times k plus 1 squared. Remember, the difference between two values of the sum is just peeling off the last term. So using the induction hypothesis, we can replace Sk with minus 1 to the k, k times k plus 1 over 2. And then we just crank out some algebra. Pull out a common term of k plus 1 over 2 and a minus 1 to the k. And note that one term has a k left over. The other term has the opposite sign, so it has a minus sign in front of it. Do a little bit more algebra, and we see that we can factor this. And finally, we get minus 1 to the k times k plus 1 over 2 times a minus 1 times a k plus 2, which, putting all together, is minus 1 to the k plus 1 times k plus 1 times k plus 2 over 2. Now, if we compare that to the original formula, notice that if we take the original formula and plug in n equals k plus 1, we get the formula that we just got here. That proves the induction. Another comment worth mentioning is that we can actually do induction with a different base case. Okay, so let's say, for example, that we can show that p of 4 is true and we can do the induction step, that for all k and n, p of k implies p of k plus 1. That actually implies that for all n greater than or equal to 4, p of n is true. Sort of more generally, whenever you pick a base case and the induction step, that tells you the thing is true starting at your base case. In sort of classical induction, we always start the base case at 1 to get all the natural numbers, but maybe in a particular case, we might have to start somewhere else, like say 4. And of course, there's nothing special about 4 here. We start anywhere, that gives us all the numbers to the right. So, here's an example. Let us try to prove that for all n greater than or equal to 4, 3 to the n is greater than n cubed. Now notice we have to take n bigger than or equal to 4 because this statement is false for n equals 3, right? Because when n equals 3, these two sides of this equation are equal. Okay, so let's first check the base case, n equals 4. Plug in n equals 4 into the equation. The left-hand side is 3 to the 4th. The right-hand side is 4 to the 3rd. And 81 is greater than 64. So the base case checks. Now we go with a standard induction step. Assume that 3 to the k is greater than k 
to the third, or k cubed. Now notice, if k is greater than or equal to 4, then k plus 1 over k is 1 plus 1 over k, which is less than 5 fourths. Okay, now it might seem weird while we're doing this now, but hang on. Notice that 5 fourths cubed is less than 2. You can plug this in a calculator and check it yourself. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that k plus 1 cubed, which I can write as k plus 1 over k cubed times k cubed, this is less than 2k cubed if k is greater than or equal to 4. So notice we're sort of cooking up a recursive relation on purpose, because remember, the recursive relation is what we want. Now we're able to do the proof. So 3 to the k plus 1 is 3 times 3 to the k, which is clearly greater than 2 times 3 to the k, which by the induction hypothesis is greater than 2k cubed, which by the thing we did before, when k is greater than or equal to 4, is greater than k plus 1 cubed. And if you look at this entire chain of inequalities using the leftmost and the rightmost term, we've shown that 3 to the k plus 1 is greater than k plus 1 cubed, and we are done. Okay, one more example. What do we get when we add 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus 16 all the way up to some power of 2? So here we're just adding powers of 2. Writing this in summation notation, what is the sum i equals 0 to n 2 to the i. Okay, well let's let's check a few. 1 plus 2 is 3, 1 plus 2 plus 4 is 7, 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 is 15, 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus 16 is 31. And if we look at those, we might notice that each of these is one less than a power of 2. In fact, the next power of 2. So here's our conjecture. If we add up the powers of 2, starting at i equals 0, going up to n, then we get the next power of 2 minus 1, or the sum i equals 0 to n, 2 to the i, is 2 to the n plus 1 minus 1. Can we prove this? To make our life a little bit easier, let's use some notation. Let's call the sum 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 all the way up to 2 to the n as qn, the sum of the first n powers of 2. Our conjecture is that qn equals 2 to the n plus 1 minus 1. Now first note, again, we can do this trick of peeling off. qn plus 1 is qn plus 2 to the n plus 1. That will be useful in the induction step. Now let's check the base case. q1 is 1 plus 2. 2 to the 2 minus 1 is 3. 1 plus 2 is 3. This checks. Now let us assume that qk equals 2 to the k plus 1 minus 1. Using our recursive formula, qk plus 1 is qk plus 2 to the k plus 1. Using the induction hypothesis, this is 2 to the k plus 1 minus 1 plus 2 to the k plus 1. Combine these powers and we get 2 times 2 to the k plus 1 minus 1, which of course is 2 to the k plus 2 minus 1, and that is our original formula with n replaced by k plus 1. Okay, now here we're going to do one bigger example that does all the steps. So notice in a lot of cases we've used an induction proof to prove a formula that we know. But we might ask, where do these formulas come from? How would one come up with such a formula? So let me give an example here. Let's consider the sum where we add up the first n perfect squares. So 1 plus 4 plus 9 plus 16, all the way up to n squared. Or using summation notation, let's call x sub n is the sum i equals 0 to n i squared. Again, here we could start the index at 1 or 0. It won't matter because of the 0 term. Now, let's compute a few by hand just to see what happens. So x1 is 1, x2 is 1 plus 4, which is 5, x3 is 1 plus 4 plus 9 is 14, x4 is 1 plus 4 plus 9 plus 16, which is 30. So I have the sequence 1, 5, 14, 30. I don't know if I could see exactly what this is doing. But here's an idea. Let's make a guess, or if we want to sound fancy, an ansatz, that xn is a cubic polynomial in n. Now you might say, where does that come from? And at this stage, it's just a guess. But it's actually not so crazy, right? 
We know that if we integrate the function x squared, we get some constant times x cubed. In fact, the constant is a third, but that's not so important now. If we integrate any quadratic polynomial, we get a cubic polynomial. Well, integration is something like adding. So if we sum n squared, then maybe we get a cubic polynomial of the form a3n cubed plus a2n squared plus a1n plus a0. Is that possible? Okay, now if xn has the form of a cubic polynomial, and at this stage, this is a really big f, what must be true? Well, if this works for all n, it'll certainly work for the first 4n. So let's plug the numbers in. If I plug in n equals 1, xn is 1, and if I plug in n into our formula, I get a0 plus a1 plus a2 plus a3, because all of the n's are 1. If I plug in n equals 2, the sum is 5, and I get a0 plus 2a1 plus 4a2 plus 8a3, because now n is 2. If I plug in n equals 3, the sum should be 14, and that's a0 plus 3a1 plus 9a2 plus 27a3. And finally, n equals 4 is 30. This is a0 plus 4a1 plus 16a2 plus 64a3. So all we need to do is solve this system. Now, admittedly, this is a complicated system to solve, a lot of details, but it is just a bunch of linear manipulations, and we can get to a solution. Three hours later. And we see that the solution of this is a0 equals 0, a1 equals 1 sixth, a2 equals 1 half, and a3 equals 1 third. You can check if you don't believe me, but this actually works. Okay, so now if this formula is true, that would imply that xn is n cubed over 3 plus n squared over 2 plus n over 6. Let me factor out a 6, and let me factor this polynomial. One power of n pulls out, and then by squinting this a little bit, we see that this is 2n plus 1 times n plus 1. So this would be our conjecture. xn is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6. Now notice, we have not yet proved this. We still need to prove this. What we have shown is that if xn has the form of a cubic polynomial, this is the cubic polynomial it must be, but we still haven't established that if. So now it's time for induction. So let's repeat our conjecture. xn is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6. And remember, we can get a recursive formula by peeling off the last term. xn plus 1 is xn plus n plus 1 squared. Let's go ahead with the proof. The base case, x1 is 1, and when I plug 1 into the formula, I get 1 times 2 times 3 over 6, which is 1. For the induction, let's assume the formula holds for k. xk equals 1 6 times k times k plus 1 times 2k plus 1. So xk plus 1 is xk plus k plus 1 squared, which is 1 6 k times k plus 1 times 2k plus 1 plus k plus 1 squared. Let's pull out a factor of 1 6 and I pull out a k plus 1, and we're left in the middle with k times 2k plus 1 plus 6 times k plus 1. Do a little bit of algebra, recombine that polynomial in the middle, and if we look at that, we can notice that the polynomial in the brackets factors as k plus 2 times 2k plus 3. Is this good or bad? Well, let's check. If we take the original formula, xn is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6, and replace an n with k plus 1, what do we obtain? k plus 1 times k plus 2 times 2k plus 3 over 6, and these match. Therefore, we have proved the theorem. That's probably a good place to stop, so I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you.